You know what's funny is every time I hear this particular intro, I feel like busting out with some some of my own rap game that I don't have. Okay, here's another weird observation I just made is I cannot find a single fitting hip hop track to play on UFO Buster Radio. It just will not happen. And let me tell you, I'll search. Every day before I come on here, I said, let me let me be cool. Let me let me be hip. Let me put some some uh some rap music on here. Maybe some trap music with some nice beat. Some uh Miami bass or something like that. And it really never happens. I just I can't find anything. Nothing at all. So I'll keep looking. Maybe on Christmas Day. I'll do a two hour like uh hip hop episode with nothing but like Christmas hip hop music. I don't know how you guys would feel about that. I would feel quite pleased if I could find two hours of hip hop music to play that's Christmas themed. Cause I mean Santa's got a gangbang, right? I mean, what else does he do? Cause I'm sure. I'm sure. He's got a dark side as well. This is uh, Manny Moonraker. This is episode number 300, the perfect one. The perfect 300. But it will be imperfect like every other episode. There are no balloons, no big celebrations. There aren't any signs going up on, on uh, Times Square or anything like that. It's just another episode, 300. Maybe next time. That I come to an even number. Maybe for 400. Or you know fuck it. 400 is such a fucked up number. It doesn't mean shit. Let's go for 500. For episode 500. We'll do something big. Huge. Just got to figure out. When the fuck is that. So I can be ready. Because it's going to take me some time to plan it. Yeah. I'm not at, uh, exactly thrilled about that. Episode 300. We've got some more space. Nonsense, science, just, um, I don't know. What I figured out today, and let me just chat with you for a second, because um, right now you should be looking at your your mobile device and saying, damn, he's about to go into a spiel, kind of like a monologue from uh, an evil doer, a villain. I'm about to monologue for you, but while I'm doing that, I need you to... Click like, share it, pause the damn podcast before I, before I do my, my super villain monologue and tell someone about it. That's it. It's a simple ask. Come on. Stop fucking around. I'm, I'm asking you a simple, a simple deed. That's all you got to do. Share it, like it, subscribe, and do whatever you can to get the message out. So now let me get back to my monologue. What I realize in the stories today is that um, scientists are people too. We may not think that, right? We are the blue-collar folks who uh, go to work 9 to 5. Not that we put 9 hours of work or even 8 hours of work into our daily business. Some of us like, fuck off, listen to podcasts like you have a bus the radio. Or uh, go over to the restroom and sit on the shitter for an hour and may believe you're in the meeting. Shit like that happens. I've experienced that myself. Can't say I've done it. No. Because <sighs> that's when your legs fall asleep, so that's not good. But you know, you see someone walking around your office all funny and shit. They were on the shitter for a long time. Doing nothing. But that's the blue collar experience, right? But what I've noticed today is that scientists are just as blue collar as everyone else. Don't let the degrees fool you. Don't let these uh, 40-page studies that don't fucking get you anywhere um, confuse you. They are just as fucked up in the head as we are. They can't make a fucking decision. They have inner demons just like everyone else. And they have to sit there and eventually they've got to pick a side. And thanks to all the alien talk... All the UFO talk, 
all the Amuamuas of the world that talk about Tic Tac UFOs and people that used to work in secret bases. Thanks to that, some of the lesser known, really fucked up in the head, confused guys that really do believe that there is alien life somewhere else, they're coming out and writing papers. Yeah, they have no fear now. Their pocket protectors are, are, they're on blast right now. They are like full alien, I don't give two shits, brand me, whatever the fuck you want to. I'm going to come out the science closet and I'm going to be free. But what that's shown us is that there no longer is this, this, uh, this wall that separates us from scientists. There's some fucked up scientists just like us. And they're climbing that wall. Some of them are getting caught on the barbed wire and we may never see them again. But uh, there's a few that are jumping over, breaking a few legs when they land, but um, they're joining us. Joining us to fully embrace the fact that, they, yeah, there might be alien life somewhere else. And we just give in Get on that crazy train, because I believe it as well. So I just gave you the synopsis for the first story, so no fucks given, don't get confused. Uh, it is the truth. There's just, you, you can't really, I don't know. You just got to embrace it, and I think that's what science is doing. And slowly, people are defecting over to the reality of things side, as opposed to the science-backed, it's impossible side. Before we get into that, I'm going to play a little song. So, I know some of you got glow sticks everywhere. Go to the trunk of your car. I mean, you might be hiding it somewhere. Go to the basement, the garage. Just pull that shit out, turn off the lights. Yeah. I want you to have fun with this. If you need to run into that corporate restroom... And turn off the lights and just go to town. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. Dude that's on the shitter right now. Taking his hour long break. He's not going to notice. He's watching something on his phone. Now you know I'm right. Because you hear that shit all the time through his headphones. Uh, here it goes. First song for today. It's called Flames. Hit it. <laughs>
beat sake, please turn the lights back on because the podcast has got to continue. Let's get to the first article. You know, someone else made the observation today that there's commercials coming in and dropping onto the track mid-sentence. But, you know, in a way, I'm thinking, is that person hanging on my every word, just waiting for me to finish my thought? Well, gosh, I like that. That's fantastic. The article that we're going to talk about right now is titled The Following. Alien life could be more common than we thought. Scientists Say, isn't that just the pot calling the kettle black? Or not? Because there was a time when scientists would not even acknowledge, not for all the money in the world, that alien life could be possible anywhere. Because we, you, the guy that's walking around with uh, smelly pants, bad breath, and all other kind of things you don't want to talk about really were the gifted miracles of the universe. Yeah. Basically, we were the ones. Even in science, scientists really believed that there could not be possibly life anywhere else just because they looked at our own solar system. And what did they find? Well, back in the day, they didn't find shit because they didn't have the ability to find anything. They made a lot of assumptions based on theories. And those theories were that it's highly improbable that any other planet in any other solar system in any other galaxy would be so fortunate to end up in what later they identified and uh, termed the Goldilocks Zone. For those of you who don't know, that is being the third planet from the sun or far enough from the sun where it won't get too hot. And also, it's not that cold. Just perfect. And in that zone, life grows, lives, evolves. Fills up the planet, then kills it with pollution. That is what they said. So now they're looking at that, right? So slowly they're finding more and more things. In our own solar system, they're starting to, you know, suck it up. And understand that life can evolve somewhere else. Just because we haven't found it, doesn't mean that it's not there. The episode image... The image right now that you see, those two bright stars, are Alpha Centauri A and B. That image is courtesy of NASA's Hubble Telescope. I want you to look at that because it's really important because this study that we're about to talk about, which actually addresses the idea that possibly there could be life somewhere else, Alpha Centauri A and B, the binary star system, was used as an example. And the one thing you have to know about this is how far Centuri A and B are. uh, But we're not going to talk about it right, right now. Let's just get into what they said. And that basically is that what they found is that theoretically, a twin star system, a binary star system, would have more of an opportunity to sustain life. And so the study is looking at the theoretical twin of the planet Earth. So how could a planet Earth survive in another star system? Well, it had better chances, right? If it was a twin star system. And the factors that they gave is the tilt. The tilt of the planet in comparison to Mars and its location in our solar system 
is what gave it the ability to create life or sustain life or make the environment suited for life to grow. So what scientists are saying is basically you would have a better opportunity to find life if you didn't just have one star for Pete's sake because we are the miracle children of the universe. Fuck, if you have two stars, you could be the worst freaking uh, bipedal animal in the universe and you would still survive because you got two stars. Imagine if you had three. You'd be gods. But the study says if you have two stars, you have a better chance if you are a planet in this Goldilocks zone they could have life evolving on it. And so, in other words, they're looking for binary star systems in order to look for that situation to happen. But don't get your panties in a bunch yet, because it turns out that there's always a caveat to everything they say, right? Because you're thinking, well, are there any binary star systems They're not sitting at the other side of the universe. Well, yes, they are. That would be the image you just looked at, Alpha Centauri A and B. Alpha Centauri is only 4.367 light years away. In layman's terms, it takes light 4.367 years to get here from Alpha Centauri. And vice versa. Right. So, for example, if you were going into your first year of high school and you sent a message to Alpha Centauri, they would receive it a little bit after you graduate. Now, it would take those fuckers maybe a year or two to figure out what the fuck they're receiving. And then they'll send a response back right before you go to maybe get your master's. That's how close they are. Most stars even binary stars, that scientists will talk about, that they research, that they look at, that they try to listen to, because fuck listening to something billions of light years away makes sense. Most stars are way too far for us to really get any indication of life. But here's one, binary star fits the theory, and they shit it all over it. Yeah, according to the theory... It turns out that the closer (laughs) that the binary star system is to the planet Earth, it appears that the the least likely it is to have life evolving on it. There's always a catch. There is always a catch. According to one of the uh, investigators for this study, multiple star systems are common And about 50% of stars have binary companion stars. So this study can be applied to a large number of solar systems. According to Mr. Lee, he is the chief investigator of this study at Georgia Tech School of Physics. And that is a statement that he gave. According to Lee also, the tilt of the planet is extremely important. The tilt of of the planet Earth is what, and again, its location is what gave it the ability to allow life to thrive, whereas the tilt for Mars kind of just fucked everything up. It's a shitty-ass planet. That's why it's dead. That's Lee's opinion, not mine. But the link is in the description if you want to look at that. Um, Apparently, they also simulated how life would evolve around binary star systems. And uh, here's a quote from Lee, actually with uh, Billy Quarles, who is uh, the principal investigator for (laughs) inside of uh, Lee's lab. Jeez. Uh, We simulated what it would be like around other binaries with multiple variations of the stars, masses, orbital qualities, and so on. The overall message was positive, but not for our nearest neighbor. See what I mean? And here's the thing. Of course... What they're telling you is, don't bother checking this out. Don't bother looking at our study, especially at the binary star that's right next to us, relatively speaking to the rest of the universe, because you ain't going to find shit. 
you have to have the ability, the equipment, and uh, the brains to look past our closest neighbor to figure out whether or not there's life there, because most most likely that's where it's going to be. When we, as blue-collar folks, you figure, fuck, why don't we just try this on the nearest one? Why bother postulating what the hell is going to happen, you know, 3.5 billion light years away? This is what uh, drives me crazy. But uh, besides looking at the article, because they kind of poo-pooed on everything, if you want to look at the actual study, it was published in the, uh, where, what's the name of this place? The Astrophysical Journal Today. Um, and it was funded by NASA's Exobiology Program. So again, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Scientists is slowly coming to the conclusion that they should be studying life somewhere else. And the possibility that there is, and there can be, and they probably are, exoplanets, even if they're binary fucking stars, that can support life, and life has evolved on them. So if anything, we could just say, shit, it's a start. It's better than where we were about 15, 20 years ago, which is what the next story is about. Uh, It's a long, long road. But, you should be free with me to think about these things the way you want to. About to leave, already packing, come with me, I'm not really asking, we'll get away to a place where we don't know. About to see the world in action, what we can be, life with no distractions, we'll get away, this is what we waited for.
I think I need to change that to like Samuel L. Jackson, like introducing the news articles. I think that would be so much uh, more exciting, right? I mean, couldn't you imagine that? Like Samuel L. Jackson introducing alien stories or uh, UFO space stories. Yeah. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker. Say what one more goddamn time. I mean, listen to that. Listen to that bravado in his voice. Like, come on. Say what again, motherfucker. It's an alien. I'm just saying. It would be much more exciting than what I have right now. This news article that we're about to talk about, believe it or not, has to do with SETI. One of my least favorite organizations in all the world. Yeah, SETI has been looking for life 35 years and the search continues. This uh, institution, SETI, still on the hunt, still looking for life. The one thing I got to say for them is this. They started the search for life when, as I said in the other article, people didn't know shit. They didn't know anything was out there. Nothing. One of the things that uh, said he was looking for, of course, was life. But at the time, there was... um, a pioneer of SETI by the name of Frank Drake back in the uh, 1960s. And he introduced an equation, the Drake Equation. The problem with the Drake Equation is that you needed to know approximately how many planets existed in order for you to figure out whether or not there was life, whether life would be abundant. And it technically, let's, let's just look at the definition, and basically the equation describes the chances of there being an inhabitable, or oh, I'm sorry, inhabited planet with life forms with whom we could communicate. Some of the considerations are, as I said, how many planets there are around a star in a galaxy, and uh, out of those planets, how many could support life. Period. Now there's other things that go into it. You know, at what part of their evolution are they? Did they get to the point where they could communicate outside of their own environment into space past their solar system? But the problem with that equation is you, at the time that this got together back in the 1960s, people had no idea how many planets there were. Thanks to the... uh, computer simulation known as NASA they've been dropping stars uh, I'm sorry planets like crazy all over the place all of a sudden there are more planets than there are stars SETI started back in uh, Mountain View California in 1984 November 20th actually tomorrow they'll hit that 35 year mark um, back in 1993, they lost their funding from, uh, the simulation called NASA. And why? Because NASA needed money, money to, uh, construct the Allen Telescope Array. And it's a, it's a crazy thing, right? A lot of people just don't think SETI's really done much of anything. I personally... Uh, don't like what they're doing. I don't think listening for things is going to get anybody anywhere. But they're doing other things, right? We've covered this before in the podcast. Uh, Jill Tater, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about potatoes right now. Uh, Jill Tarter, now I'm going moving over to fish. Uh, Jill Tarter is a co-founder of the Institute. She said this, we want to look at all the sky all the time. Well, Jill, you need money for that. Shit like that does not just happen for free. And according to Jill, from some of the uh, discoveries that NASA has has made since SETI first started, the Milky Way itself has more planets than it does stars. So there's a lot more to that Drake equation. So now the, the issue is, 
can you determine how many of those abundant planets are in the zone where life can evolve? And then you throw in your your Drake equation and try to figure out, is it possible that life elsewhere is more abundant than what we thought it was? I mean, personally, you ask someone that got probed just last week whether or not life is abundant somewhere else. I'm sure they'll tell you yes, emphatically. I'm sure they'll have some flashbacks, some PTSD to go along with it. Uh, And the truth is that uh, SETI is looking for a lot of different ways to identify life in other planets and things like that. Uh, trying to figure out if there is something out there. Um, but they know that they have to change with the times. Uh, one of the things that uh, was alluded to by Seth Shawshak, uh, he's the uh, senior astronomer at SETI, is that the big change has been a shift in emphasis toward astrobiology. Today, the majority of scientists here are studying life in space like on Mars, Enceladus, Europa, and elsewhere. Which is important. And I listened. If you listen to the podcast for a while, I've said this a quadrillion billion times over many light years away. You cannot continue to look at things 4.25 billion light years away if you don't even understand what the fuck is in your backyard. Seth said that in a nicer way. If you don't understand what's on Europa, Saturn, Mars, Neptune, Pluto, if you have no understanding of these planets, what makes you think you can figure out if there's life 5 billion light years away? No, stop that shit. Give us the money back. We need a refund. Put all that stinking ass money that you spent looking at someplace you can't even identify clearly. Whether or not it really can hold life, you base it all on theories, on locations, and blurry ass images. Why don't you focus in on our own solar system? Get yourself a good foundation. Learn what it really means to hold life. Can life be found on Enceladus? Does Mars hold a bunch of microbial beings farting away seasonally? Then tell me, at that point, can you really match that to things that are way too far for you to be able to identify at this point in time? I mean, it's just that easy. I mean, they have no point of reference. None. They're getting it. NASA slowly is identifying more and more planets. But we still don't have a point of reference of how we truly identify life in other places other than our own planet, and that's where we're stuck. Uh, Jill Tarter, formerly Tater, uh, also thinks that SETI is a long-term project, and here's a quote from her. Uh, You don't get out of bed every morning and say, today's the day I'm going to find a signal. Which, honestly, if that's what I'm paid for, I'd fucking wish I'd find a signal. But anyway... Uh, But you get out of bed saying, I'm going to do something today to improve our capability of searching to make our search better. Well, Seti, apparently (laughs) Tater just told us that uh, Seti has not gotten out of bed in 35 fucking years. You guys are still trying to figure it out. You're all asleep. Wake up. It's about time you guys got woke. I don't know where this is going. I, I really don't think SETI is going to be the answer. I, I put all my money on Elon Musk. Uh, I think he's going to be the one who is going to land on Mars or throw some people out there that are going to kiss their asses goodbye in their lives. And uh, they're going to go up there with a few microscopes um, and find life on Mars. Now, this 2020 rover that NASA is shooting up, it might find some forms of life where it's landing but uh, again I invite you guys to go out there and look at specifically everywhere that NASA is landing rovers on Mars 
and notice that they are targeting a specific area. They're not going too far north and not, they're not going too far south. And unfortunately for us, the places where signs of life apparently are given off seasonal oxygen, carbon dioxide, and all that craziness are not anywhere near the rovers. And there's got to be a reason for that. Conspiracy, I guess. Conspiracy. This is the end of the podcast. Um, what can I do? I guess I'd have to end it, but I, don't forget to share it, like it, tell your peoples about it. We're going to end with a song called Hyperdrive because SETI needs to get a hyperdrive. They need to get their shit in, in, uh, into the new millennium. Use some new technologies and stop listening for shit. Fuck. No one's trying to communicate with you. Grow up. Drunk